Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Stephanie Coulter of the Texas Heart Institute. I'm part of the Center for Women's Heart and Vascular Health, and I'm here today to speak to the Perfusion Conference 2021 about hypertension as a disease and as a risk factor. And we're going to go over some interesting data and blood pressure guideline changes. So as you know, heart disease is still the number one cause of death in the U.S. and in the world. And stroke, which is really a similar etiology in its pathophysiology to artery disease in the heart, is the number five cause of death in the U.S., so if you add all of these things together, cardiovascular disease claims more lives than all forms of cancer combined. And there are currently about 86 million Americans living with some form of cardiovascular disease or the after effects of a stroke. Here's actually the breakdown of deaths attributable to cardiovascular disease in America with coronary heart disease or obstructive artery disease, about half of it, stroke being about 16%, heart failure, which includes genetic cardiomyopathy, valvular cardiomyopathy, but most commonly coronary artery disease as a cause of ischemic heart failure. And then there's high blood pressure and diseases of the aorta and the periphery and then other causes. But still the major cause of death in the US for both men and women is column A, which is about 400,000 deaths per year for coronary artery disease in both women and in men. And in fact, you can see that in women, you know, we've overtaken um, the death rate by men um, for cardiac disease, which is interesting in that it's likely because women live longer, so they live longer to have the manifestations of coronary disease. Column B is actually all forms of cancer, and then there's diabetes, accidents, and you can see that the lion's share of death in America is due to cardiac disease and um, secondary, um, and second would be um, cancer. So breaking down um, cardiovascular disease, if we look at the rates of heart attacks um, per year, and we break it down by age, gender, and ethnicity, as you grow older, your risk of cardiovascular disease really goes up, particularly in um, men after age 45 and in women, really after menopause, really around age 50. You can see that African-Americans compared to whites have a much greater toll of death due to um, myocardial infarction and fatal coronary disease um, with um, African-American males greater than um, white males, but African-American females have a greater risk than white males, which is um, really a staggering statistic. The prevalence of stroke by age and gender is shown in the following graph, which shows that really strokes are really increased in the elderly and um, are, are more common actually in men than in women. But you can see that the, the burden really grows as we, as we age. And here is um, stroke death rate by age, sex, and race. And you can see that the rate of death due to stroke in black Americans is double the risk of white Americans, um, Hispanics and Native Americans as well. The causes of death of in women really par parallel what we find in the common group. But since we're a center for women's health, we try to show the summary statistics that support um, um, the cause of death in women. And you can see again, that cardiovascular disease is about 53% of the death rate in women. Cancer is about 25%. Um, so it's really kind of small, but most importantly, breast cancer, which has gotten a lot of publicity in the last 15 to 20 years because of great um, campaigns to improve um, women's outcome um, have really highlighted the preventable um, effects of breast cancer and but breast cancer deaths in American women is really only about 4% of all American women's deaths. So of note, hospital costs are increasing. Um, you can see, I love this slide, that medications really are reasonably kind of flat-ish. Physician reimbursement, nursing home costs, home health are all flat, but the curve for the hospital continues to rise. So there's gonna be increasing pressure on hospitals and on um, the budgets of hospitals to moderate the rise in the cost of um, care.
heart disease death rates, however, this is super um, optimistic slide to show how well we have done in the last 20 years to reduce the risk of dying from heart cardiovascular disease. So you can see that in blue men and in red women, um, starting from when the statistics were originally um, initiated, that male deaths were, uh, you know, above almost 500,000 deaths per year, and women were getting up there as well. And they started to fall, men's rates of death started to fall in the mid 80s with the advent of some campaigns targeting males, including um, some major studies at this time, which showed that aspirin therapy and beta blocker therapy um, actually moderated the risk of dying. And big trials for um, acute per, um, treatment of acute MI, including angioplasty, the um, invention of the statins and better blood pressure um, medications really went into the into effect during the late half of the 20th, the, la the late quarter of the 20th century. And you can see that since 2000, rates of death in both males and females have actually just fallen dramatically. Overall, there's been about a 50% reduction in the risk of dying of a cardiovascular disease in both males and females. And those rates had continued to decline until the most recent summary statistics, which showed that there'd been an uptick in the risk of dying um, in both men and in women, which is kind of concerning. The reason for these um, reductions is twofold. One is that we're much better at prevention. So half the benefit here is a credit to, to prevention, which is what we do in the office. We treat people with aspirin, blood pressure control, cholesterol drugs. We're good with diabetes um, medications these days, um, as well as aspirin and Plavix for people that have been determined to have um, established vascular disease. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on advertising campaigns, particularly for women, the Go Red campaign of Laura Bush should be um, um, shown, has been shown to have benefited the benefits in women. So where is heart disease and stroke? I mean, where in the country is it? Now, this is important to me because A, I'm from Louisiana and B, I live in Texas. And if you can see these graphs for cardiovascular disease on top, those that are shaded in dark, are ground zero for death rates due to vascular disease. If you look at coronary disease deaths, it's a little bit north of Louisiana. And if you look at stroke rate deaths, you know, we're looking at the deep south. So we're looking at some genetic risk, um, behavioral risks, and possibly even access to um, quality medical plans, um, given the impoverished um, nature of some of these um, states. If you look at the age adjusted risk for stroke and heart disease here, blue is bad and orange or red is good. And deep blue is deep south. Texas is purple on the left, which is kind of an intermediate risk group, but certainly we want to be red in this, in this map. Um, unfortunately, we're green in stroke risk. So we're at a great risk. Remember that hypertension is a disease and it's a risk factor for artery disease. It's also a risk factor for kidney artery disease. It's also a risk factor for stroke. So hypertension causes coronary disease. It leads to cardiomyopathy, especially hypertensive cardiomyopathy, which is much more common in the black population. Um, it can lead to heart failure. It can cause heart rhythm disturbances. In fact, the main cause for AFib is hypertension. Um, it can lead to stroke, peripheral artery disease, et cetera. So remember that hypertension is a vascular disease and it is thought to be due to the tension in the blood vessel, but this tension in the blood vessel allows for plaque to develop and that plaque causes strokes, heart attacks, peripheral artery disease and aneurysms. A landmark trial called the SPRINT study, um, we're gonna go over a little bit because it's super important and it's changed our guidelines for how we take care of and how we um, manage hypertension in the outpatient setting. This was a landmark study and um, we had um, Dr. Welton as a visiting professor um, for a symposium that we host every year and um, 
a very important study. It was basically developed as the first strategy trial for blood pressure control. So in the past, we had really no threshold for when blood pressure control should be targeted. We had a lot of trials looking at if beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or calcium channel blockers were better. But really what we never had was a strategy trial, which would be who needs treatment and to what goal. And that was the purpose of the SPRINT trial. So we know that in observational studies that there's a strong association between blood pressure and death due to cardiovascular disease, and that high blood pressure is extremely common, and that it's the number one risk factor for mortality and disability in age-adjusted life years. Um, worldwide, there's about a billion people that are adults that have hypertension. And clinical trials have demonstrated antihypertensive therapy reduces the risk of heart disease. The optimal target for blood pressure lowering had never been established. So the research question really was, should we target a better blood pressure goal, a lower goal, where the systolic average blood pressure target in this trial was 120 versus standard treatment, which was a blood pressure of 140. The major inclusion criteria for the SPRINT study included age over 50, a systolic blood pressure treated or untreated of 130 to 180, and you had to have at least one additional cardiovascular risk modifiers. Either you had to have clinical or subclinical coronary disease, but not stroke. You could have chronic kidney disease, but you had to have a GFR greater than 20, or a Framingham risk score over 15%, which is really quite high, and or age over 75. The exclusion criteria were stroke, diabetes, polycystic kidney disease, heart failure, symptoms or an EF less than 35, over a gram of proteinuria, um, chronic kidney disease with a GFR less than 20, or in a patient that you didn't think could comply with the um, trial. So the enrollment and follow-up experience is as follows, where there were about 14,600 patients who were screened. There were about 9,361 randomized, half and half to intensive treatment or standard treatment. And in the end, with discontinuation, loss to follow-up. And so um, there were 4,678 and 4,683 um, analyzed it with an intention to treat. Here are the baseline characteristics. The mean age was about 68. Uh, about 28% of patients were um, over 75. About a third were female. About um, 29, 30% were African-American. About 10% were Hispanic. 20% had prior vascular disease. The 10-year mean Framingham cardiac risk score was 20, which is a really, really risky population. So the study inclusion criteria got what the study um, designers was looking for. They got people that were at grave risk of heart disease. About 90% of the people were already on medications. The average number of meds was 1.8. Blood pressure on average was actually really pretty well controlled in this trial. In fact, by many standards for doctors, the average blood pressure of 140 over 80 was like, you know, pretty good. Pre-specified groups were um, looked at for special interests, age, of course, gender, race, um, renal dysfunction, vascular disease, and blood pressure um, levels. So the primary outcome was a composite of a first occurrence of myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, cardiac death. The primary hypothesis was that cardiovascular composite event rates would be lower in the intensive compared to the standard treatment. And the estimated power to detect um, a, what was thought to be um, well within the means of the um, power for this um, trial design and um, with four to six years of follow-up. So what, what did we do for the blood pressure? We monitored the blood pressure monthly for three months and every three months thereafter, medicines were titrated and decisions based on the mean blood pressure. They did three readings at blood pressure readings at each visits using a um, structured step care approach. And any drug from the classes were available and free of charge to the investigators to give to the patients and um, periodic assessments of orthostatic hypotension and related symptoms were, were, were checked at follow-up. Here's the algorithm for your um, review. 
but basically they achieved what their goals were at one year. The, well, actually by several months, the standard treatment group was 140, you know, 130 to 140, but the intensively treated group had intensively managed blood pressure with average systolic blood pressure of 120. Okay, so they achieved their results and you can see the curve separated quite early and stayed stable through over four years. Um, on August the 20th, 2015, the DSMB stopped the study because um, there was too much benefit in the group that was treated with the intensive um, treatment at a median follow-up of 3.2 years. Um, and the secondary non-cardiovascular outcomes. So this trial ran a design where there were three separate studies. There was SPRINT hypertension, SPRINT mind, looking at cognitive impairment, and SPRINT renal, where they were looking at renal, inter renal outcomes, and these studies were reported separately. So the SPRINT primary outcome was cardiac, and you can see that there were 319 events in the standard treatment versus 200 and um, 43 in the intensively treated group with the number needed to treat to prevent, a, to prevent a primary outcome of 61. So you can see the primary events uh, and, a, and the um, p-values at the far right that the, the composite in, um, outcome was largely driven by heart failure and cardiovascular death. So really a big impact on the rate of um, uh, heart failure and death and almost a statistical getting toward um, MI as well. All cause mortality you can see is reduced and serious adverse events is seen here in this trial in this slide that showed um, there was more renal injury 4.1 percent versus 2.5 percent um, in the intensively treated group compared to the standard which was obviously statistically significant. There was abnormalities of the electrolytes more commonly in the intensively treated group, as well as um, syncope and hypotension. Um, the sodium you can see, orthostatic hypotension was actually quite um, uncommon to be associated with dizziness, but was found to be about 16% of the population when they checked it in the office. So and finally, um, participants in the U.S. with hypertension and additional cardiovascular risk when treated aggressively for blood pressure had reduction in cardiovascular events, which is super important. Um, the treatment effects were similar in all six pre-specified groups of interest and the number needed to treat to prevent the primary outcome event was 61 and to prevent a death was 90, which is certainly part of what we should be doing and we've how, how we should incorporate this into our, our normal um, routine for taking care of patients. Um, participants without kidney disease um, had an incidence of a GFR reduction of about 30% more common than the intensively treated group, but there were no significant serious adverse events between the two and no real differences in um, renal outcomes within those that had CKD at baseline. The SPRINT MIND trial looked at cognitive um, changes before and after treatment in the intensive versus the standard treatment group. And this it was super important, showed that um, the risk of mild cognitive impairment and the risk of cognitive impairment and dementia was reduced by intensive blood pressure control which is super important. So in fact, um, Sprint Mind um, really helps us because it shows us there are only a few things that you can do to reduce the risk for dementia long-term. One is exercise, two is um, blood pressure control. I mean, really none of the medicines for Alzheimer's have really shown much benefit for cognitive decline. So the JNCI or the Joint Commission for um, the Treatment, Prevention and Evaluation of High Blood Pressure, JNC7 published in 2003 was updated in 2017. And these guidelines have been updated to say that healthcare providers should follow the following standards for accurate blood pressure measurement. We should check the blood pressure on more than two readings on at least more than two occasions to estimate the individual blood pressure. 
the out of office and self-monitoring of blood pressure are recommended to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension and for titration of blood pressure lowering. And we've changed the categories so that normal blood pressure is less than systolic of 120 and diastolic less than 80. Blood pressure over 120 or over 80 is abnormal now. High blood pressure is considered when the blood pressure is over 130 or over 80 and that's stage one, 130 to 139, or bottom number, 80 to 90. And high blood pressure stage two is when it's over 140 or greater than 90. And hypertensive crisis is when the blood pressure is systolic greater than 180 or diastolic greater than 120 with associated symptoms. And here it is in another way that you can assess it. But it's important to remember that hypertension is super common in America. So in fact, the risk of a 40 year old developing hypertension in America is 93% in African Americans. It's 92% for Hispanics. It's 86% for whites. It's 84% for Asian Chinese. And it is the leading cause of death and disability adjusted life years worldwide. And is a major contributor to events in women and blacks compared with whites in persons over 30 Higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure are associated with adverse cardiac risk, heart attack, heart failure, stroke, artery disease, and aneurysm. So prevention and early intervention is the key. There are things that you can and things that you cannot control. You can control your blood pressure now. Medicines have improved dramatically. Blood pressure can be controlled with no real significant um, side effects. We can move blood pressure meds around. You need to check your blood pressure and monitor the, your blood pressure at home. You need to use a good cuff and, um, and you need a good relationship with your physician so that you can moderate your risk. It's been shown actually recently in a trial of blood pressure control that in fact barber shops were better than doctors at controlling the blood pressure if given an algorithm to treat the blood pressure. And um, I love this study because it shows that frequent monitoring and simple algorith algorithmic changes to blood pressure medications can be achieved out of the hospital, out of the doctor's office by like not even medical professionals. So as a medical profession, we, we, we don't have a good excuse as why we're not being able to get people's blood pressure under control. We're not, we're not educating the public better. I think there's a lot we could do to improve it. I spend a lot of time in my office and in health screenings explaining how to measure blood pressure and how to moderate it with exercise and salt restriction. But certainly blood pressure is the top of the list of things that need to be controlled in order to prevent artery disease, kidney failure, stroke, and death. Cholesterol levels can be controlled. Obesity levels, there are new targets for obesity um, and new medicines that are coming out. There's been a recent study looking at Ozempic, which is um, a specialized inhibitor of um, a protein in the kidney that um, makes you lose glucose into your urine, but it also has a major effect on death due to heart failure, a reduction in kidney disease, and also improves your diabetes. Diet has worsened over the last 20 years in America with the average American eating over six to 800 calories more than they did 20 years ago. The obesity problem isn't just genetics because it changed within the last 20 years. Americans are putting on fat at record levels in the hospital. You know, if you didn't write down the BSA when you are um, measuring on your intake, you could just assume that the BSA is over two in most hospitalized patients. And that includes women. Um, certainly, Diet needs a major, major modification in America, but certainly we can control if we smoke, we can control our physical activity. We should be able to control our alcohol and drug use. And we may or may not be able to control our stress, our anxiety and depression, particularly in this last year where so many things were out of our control. All the things that are good for the body, 
they tend to be good for all the systems in the body. So exercise, diet changes, lack of smoking, they benefit the entire body. They reduce stress and anxiety. They reduce your blood pressure. They reduce your diabetes risk. They reduce your cholesterol. All in all, all of this lifestyle choices accounts for about 60% of our life expectancy. Medications account for maybe 20% of our life expectancy. And our genetic risk accounts for the other 20%. The things that we cannot control include our genetics, our family history, our age, it's sad, and our race. But certainly it's important that as healthcare um, participants, that we help our patients understand their risks. We need to know what our risks are, what the risks are to the patients. There is a risk score tool that's been developed by um, some research groups in the country, and it's been adopted by the American College of Cardiology, which is a, a risk estimate for 10-year risk for the development of heart events in cardiac disease. It also um, gives a lifetime risk for cardiac disease, but this risk score is calculated based on your age, your sex, your race, your diastolic and systolic blood pressure, your total, your LDL, and your non-HDL cholesterol, whether or not you're diabetic, whether or not you smoke, and whether or not you're on hypertensive treatment, a statin, or aspirin. And based on this risk calculated score, it helps us to estimate who would benefit from treatment for the prevention of cardiac disease. And you can see from this slide that pharmacologic treatment for blood pressure reduction is related to the ASCVD risk score. And we recommend patients that have a high ASCVD risk score, um, those individuals who also have a diastolic blood pressure over 80 or a systolic blood pressure average over 130, either with or without clinical events should be treated for high blood pressure with the goal of a blood pressure of 120 over 80. It's important to remember that the prevalence of hypertension increases as every decade as we age. So at 80, 80% 80 of people have hypertension at 90, 90%. But men tend to have higher blood pressures than women. And women start to catch up after the fifth decade, after the onset of the menopause. So in fact, um, most people in America will make threshold for the treatment of blood pressure. Blood pressure should be moderated by your lifestyle. So in fact, there's always a strong, strong emphasis on exercise, salt restriction, healthy fruits and vegetables, because all of these things have a dramatic impact on the risk for cancer, as well as cardiovascular events. And also they improve your blood pressure control. But outside of lifestyle, if the blood pressure remains elevated, certainly treatment of high blood pressure is been, has been successfully shown to reduce cardiovascular mortality, heart failure deaths, cognitive impairment, as well as kidney disease in patients who have systolic blood pressure above 130 systolic or diastolic above 80. We've made tremendous um, gains in the last 20 years Unfortunately, for hospital administrators, we're reducing the rates of bypass and coronary stenting. But for all of our patients and for society in general, we're making a dent in the deadliest disease in our, in our existence at this time. And every one of us is contributing to these um, beneficial effects. I hope this lecture is well received. And if there are any comments or questions, please reach out to me. We're eager to respond here at Texas Heart Institute, and we're eager to make all of our colleagues as healthy as we can. Thank you.